Hi everyone, my name is Makiko Oku. Um, I'm recording this lecture at my home in the New York area in the United States. Um, it's a pleasure to be your lecturer today and thank you for joining me. Um, before I get into the lecture itself, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I am an academic by training in gender studies and human rights. Um, my work centers specifically on sexual and gender-based violence during armed conflict and war. I know it's a very heavy topic, but I think it's a very important one. I've done extensive work and travel relating to this topic, interviewed many victims and survivors of wartime violence, and I've also taught university courses on gender studies, feminist theory, and violence for many years in the United States. Um, on a more personal level, I was born in Japan and moved to the United States when I was six years old. Um, I went to elementary school in San Diego, California, and then moved back to Japan to the city of Sapporo in Hokkaido for junior high school and high school. And then I went to university in Kyoto and studied political science, and then I went to the U.S. to pursue graduate studies. Um, so I go back to Japan maybe once a year, and which is not enough for me. I miss the food, I miss a good soba, uh, and the hospitality, and how convenient konbinis are in Japan. My parents and grandmother still live in Sapporo, and my sister and her family live in Nagano. And I have so many great friends all over Japan. So I am Japanese. Uh, my parents are both Japanese, but I have lived half of my life in Japan and half of my life in the United States. I was raised bilingually and biculturally, speaking both English and, and Japanese fluently and understanding both American and Japanese customs and cultures. And because of my exposure to these two languages and two cultures since very young, uh, I've been thinking about English and the Japanese people for as long as I could remember. And I've been keen on observing and try to make sense of people who are bilingual and bicultural. So based on my US-Japan upbringing and the bicultural and bilingual or even multicultural and multilingual people I've met along the way, I co-published a book in 2014 titled Biculturalism and the Japanese with my dear friend Kenji Kushida. So today's lecture is based primarily on our book. So why biculturalism? Why biculturalism and the Japanese? Um, it is because um, I believe becoming bicultural will enable you to shine and thrive in the globalized world in your day-to-day -day lives and in the future. And I believe you'll be a wonderful asset. It is a useful tool in international business settings or when you study abroad or simply when you move to a new country or a new town. You'll be able to communicate and connect with people more effectively and wholeheartedly. And when you look at the bigger picture, being bicultural will most likely enrich your life and you will have more empathy towards people around you. This may sound too good to be true but, and somewhat ambitious, but I have met so many different people, so many Japanese people who are bicultural and are bicultural at a very high level. And I am certain that what I'm saying here is actually true. Now, let's get into the what. Uh, what is biculturalism? What does biculturalism in the Japanese mean? And I have a feeling you had never heard of this word uh, prior to this lecture, but um, don't worry, I'll break it down for you. When you look at the origin of the word biculture, uh, it basically means two cultures. In my definition of bicultural, and when you look at the deeper meaning of the concept, being bicultural means to have the ability to understand two different cultures or sociocultural factors 
and adapt freely to each one of them. There is a specific reason why I use the word bicultural, and it is because I'm juxtaposing or making a direct comparison with the word bilingual. As many of you know, the concept of multiculturalism or multiculture, which means multiple cultures, um, that there is this concept, and not just two, but many. Some people argue that being in touch with a range of cultures and being multicultural is preferable than bicultural. But the reason why I focus on biculture is that in Japan, there's a huge focus on becoming bilingual when it comes to learning English. And the word bilingual and the idea that you need to become bilingual seems to be all over the place. And it is a skill and status everybody wants to obtain. So this is where my criticism comes in, my general criticism towards English education in Japan or foreign language education in Japan. There is so much missing when you focus solely on the language aspect or becoming bilingual. To be bilingual means to be able to speak two languages. In most cases in Japan, to be bilingual means to be able to speak English and Japanese. When you look at English education in Japan, the focus seems to be on grammar, on vocabulary, on sentence structure, and on some conversation. There is no denying that it is important to have these elements under your belt, but what's lacking is the idea that language is a great communication tool that enables you to connect with people, learn from them, empathize with them, and enrich your life. In other words, the communication part of language and the cultural aspect of language or the human aspect of language is very much missing. So how can you become uh, a better communicator? How can you communicate more effectively in English? Instead of fixating on being grammatically correct or pronouncing your R's and L's correctly, learn from the way people actually communicate. Uh, pay attention to the tempo of a conversation and verbal expression and gestures and jokes people tell. Here's one example. Um, when you meet someone in a business setting for the first time in Japan, what do you do? You typically introduce yourself, bow, hand the other person your business card, and you will say, yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Now, in the US, you will most likely shake hands and briefly introduce yourself. For instance, hi, my name is Michael, call me Mike. And it's not the norm to give the other person your business card at the beginning. Now here's another example. In Japan, do you kiss your friend or colleague on the cheek? Maybe if you're dating, yes, but you normally don't. But in the US, when you see a friend, you usually hug and kiss on the cheek. Um, that's normal. I know hugging has become more common in Japan, but I'm pretty sure kissing is not popular. In some cultures in Europe and in Latin America, you kiss on the cheek, or on each cheek, you actually kiss twice. It's not necessarily what you say, uh, but about the flows and gestures and customs that you need to be familiar with in order to start a good conversation. So going back to how to become a better communicator in English, Instead of memorizing sentence structures, pay attention to the flow and delivery of conversation. I often hear Japanese people in the US complain that Americans talk a lot and they struggle to have a decent conversation. The norm in Japan is to wait until the other person stops talking and you nod to ensure that you're paying attention. But if you do that in the United States, you're never going to get a chance to talk. 
If you pay attention to how people actually converse, you'll quickly learn that interfering the other person doesn't necessarily mean that you're being rude. That's just the norm in the United States. Yes, it's good to be considerate and not jump in all the time. And yes, it's, it's up to you to honor the Japanese style of communicating. But whatever you choose to do, you'll be at ease when you know the various flows and deliveries of communication and adapt to different ways of communicating. Instead of memorizing new English words, learn how to debate and negotiate in English. Learn the kind of logic、uh, people use to have discussions and how people agree and disagree. Practice to get your opinion heard in discussions. Instead of being afraid、uh, to make mistakes in speech, Spend time reading and learning about the customs, politics, and even pop culture.、Uh, when you know more about the worldview of that particular country and culture, you'll be able to connect with people better.、Um, I have an American friend who is a lawyer who lived in Japan for work. He told me that he loved karaoke and he often sang with his Japanese work friends. He told me his favorite song was Roman Hiko by Kome Kome Kurabu, which was a very popular song back in the 80s. His Japanese colleagues loved hearing him sing in Japanese. It was a great icebreaker. This may be a very small act, but the fact that an American guy can sing a Japanese song in Japanese made him stand out, and everyone loved him for that. On a rather Serious note,、uh, when talking about understanding politics,、um, the issue of Hiroshima and the atomic bomb still c o m e up between US and Japan. As a Japanese person, you probably know the Japanese side of the story that up to 160,000 people died immediately after and a few months after the bomb was dropped. Um, Hiroshima was the first city in the world to be a victim of an atomic bomb. And it was a very terrible atrocity in Japan and in Japanese history. But there is a different viewpoint on Hiroshima in the US. Some people believe that dropping the bomb was necessary because it ended the war swiftly and that they were able to keep the number of casualties low. Many US military personnel even praise that it was a successful military tactic, which may be a very hard comment to hear for the Japanese people. It is important to make an effort to learn about different viewpoints on politics, on religion, and whether you agree or disagree. Here's a second point as to how to become bicultural.、Um, and the answer is in the notion of double insider outsider perspective.、Uh, this stems from my experience of meeting people、uh, who are bicultural at a very high level and seeing the common experiences these people had.、Uh, now, this double insider outsider perspective. May sound a bit complex, but it's actually quite simple.、Um, so here's how it goes First, you start from home, a country or a town or any environment where you feel comfortable. You know how things work in that environment and how people function and the language people speak, and you navigate pretty easily. In a way, you're an insider in this world, you are a local. And then you have the opportunity to move to another country or town or environment, and you are in an away situation. You're in this new environment,、uh, everything seems unfamiliar, you don't know how people function and communicate, you may not know the language people speak,、uh, you don't know the rules, you don't know what's right and what's wrong, and you feel kind of lost. You feel like an outsider in this new world. You struggle, you try to navigate, but eventually, after being in that environment for a while, 
you become more and more familiar with the setting. Um, you no longer feel lost. You know the rules, you know how people communicate, and you feel comfortable in this socio-cultural setting. You no longer feel like you're in an away situation. Uh, in some ways, you've become an insider and a local in this world. So here's an example, and I'll use myself as an example. I went to junior high school and high school in Sapporo, which was home to me. Uh, I was very familiar with Sapporo and how things worked in that city. And then I moved to Kyoto to go to college. I was in a new environment with a new set of friends. The weather was different, buildings looked different, people spoke in Kyoto Ben. Um, and I was living alone far from my family. Um, I was unfamiliar with this new world. Uh, but after a while, I became familiar with Kyoto and university life. I knew where to go shopping. I made friends. I no, no longer felt like I was in an away situation. Uh, but in fact, Kyoto started feeling like home. I was not an outsider of Kyoto anymore, but actually turned into an insider after living there for four years. Even now, when I visit Kyoto, it feels like home to me. Now, here's the next key step to the idea of double insider outsider perspective. After you had gone from home to away, you now then go back to your original home setting. And then, all of a sudden, the place you thought of as home start to feel unfamiliar to you. Um, Although you were an insider or a local, now you actually feel like an outsider in your home setting. Uh, you start asking yourself, like, why didn't I see this before? Why does it look so different? Uh, it's not just because time had passed, but it's because now you see your home objectively. And it's because you now have a different view of your home environment. Going back to my example, um, after I graduated from college, I went back to Sapporo and stayed with my parents. Um, all of a sudden, Sapporo seemed unfamiliar to me. It was, uh, I was noticing how differently people dressed, how people talked. At the same time, I was impressed with the food, how delicious the food was, and how the snow looked beautiful than ever before. I was never aware of those things before I lived in Kyoto. So being away from Sapporo made me appreciate my home and gave me a different perspective. So this is the double insider-outsider perspective. Having this viewpoint and going back and forth between home and away and seeing both worlds as an insider and an outsider uh, gives you a unique view on the two worlds. And you've examined both worlds from multiple angles from inside out. Now this experience and perspective gives you an opportunity to think about what you took for granted and gain a distinct perspective on where you come from and where you're at. It will give you an opportunity to learn to adapt, to readjust, to reshape and acclimate to a new environment. You'll struggle, you'll be confused, you'll try to make sense of the world around you, um, but the experience will lead you to adapt better to new environments. And the more you have these double insider-outsider experiences and exchanges, you adapt more freely and smoothly, and your bicultural level will be higher. The two different home and away situations can be in a domestic setting like Osaka and Kyoto, or Hokkaido and Okinawa, or in an international setting like US and Japan, India and Japan, Japan and Nigeria. 
It's not limited to countries and places, but also, for instance, working for a Japanese company as opposed to working for a foreign company, or switching schools from one high school to another. It is interesting that now I see more and more job ads, uh, especially ones related to global business, that say you must be bilingual and bicultural, or even multilingual and multicultural. Um, these companies want to hire people who not only speak uh, different languages, but also someone who is a great communicator and can adapt to different settings uh, without a problem. That's the kind of skill set I'm talking about here. Now, to uh, sum up my lecture, um, I want to repeat that becoming bicultural will enable you to shine and thrive in the globalized world. First of all, if you want to become bicultural, learn how to communicate. Learn how to communicate effectively. English is a communication tool uh, for you to connect with the people around you. And secondly, go gain that double insider outsider perspective. Leave your comfortable home and put yourself through an away situation. Learn from being an insider and outsider, and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Uh, mistakes will make you stronger. In the end, I sincerely believe that um, being bicultural will make you a beautiful asset in the world. And the reality is that Japanese people are more bilingual than you think.、Um, you're more bilingual than you think.、Um, but the problem is that people are not bicultural. You're probably not bicultural. You don't know how to actually communicate and connect with people using English. You don't know what to say. You're afraid to make mistakes because you're fixated on perfect grammar and sentence structure. You're stuck in your home situation, not making yourself adapt to a totally different environment. So my message to you is to free yourself from all of that and challenge yourself to become bicultural. So that's it for my lecture. Thank you so much for listening.、Um, if you have any questions or any suggestions,、uh, feel free to contact me. Um, I'd be happy to get back to you. Thank you again, and have a great day.